This is the solution to Integrity's July XSS challenge by Vroomi. Let's get into it. Every month, Integrity hosts a challenge for the community and you can solve the challenge. And if you do, then you have a chance at winning some swag. Now this July challenge has already ended and this is the write-up video, but you can still try this challenge out at challenge-0722.integrity.io. Now, if you want to win some swag in the next month, then be sure to follow Integrity on Twitter because that's where we announce our new challenges. And if you follow us, you will never miss out on these challenges in the future and you can get some cool swag. But let's get back on track. We're here to solve July's challenge. And in order to solve a challenge, we first need to get acquainted with it. We need to do some enumeration. As always, the challenge has this overview page that explains the challenge, the rules, and what the solution should be. But then at the bottom, in an iframe, we have our challenge page. This is where it's all going to go down, but we also have a link to go directly to the challenge page, which is easier to work with. But this is our challenge, the awesome kitty blog. We have to find an XSS on this page. We can see that there are some posts here made by Jake. And by Anton, uh, we also have an about section, we have some archives, and we also have some information at the bottom saying it's a blog template for Bootstrap and, and who made it. And we have a way of going back to the top of the blog. Now we also have some other links for these usernames, but they don't seem to link anywhere. So this must be an undeveloped feature so far. Uh, but then we also have archives, which are links, and these actually do something because they add a get parameter month to the URL with, in this case, either three or two, and that shows different content on the page. So, so far, that is really the only user input I've found on this page, that month parameter. So let's try to find out what happens. Is this month parameter going to change anything uh, in the client? Is it going to run a JavaScript script uh, on the client? Is the server going to send us this content? I want to find that out. So I'm going to go in and inspect elements into the network tab, and I'm going to make this request. Here we see the request and if we open it up and look at the response, we see that it contains the content. So the server sent us the content for the posts. Now, if I change this to month three, now if I open up this request, we see that indeed the content is again here. So this get parameter is handled by the server and is our user input. Now we can start looking at how this would be implemented in the backend. If I were to make a blog, uh, what would I do? How would I implement it? And a really valid guess and a good guess is that this is using an SQL server on the backend, a database that it's querying for these posts. So it might be doing something in the back saying like, select the post from uh, the posts where the month equals three. That could be possible. So uh, under that assumption, let's try out, uh, let's enter a month that doesn't exist, such as 999. In that case, well, we don't get any content because this month doesn't exist. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, this is an SQL. Uh, we we're looking for an SQL injection here. So what happens if we enter a quote? Well, if we enter a quote, we get error. That is interesting because that is what we would expect if SQL is running here, that it would error out. So again, very, very interesting. Uh, let's try to see if we can actually get a very simple SQL injection working here. So I'm going to select all the posts from month 999, which we know doesn't exist. And then I'm going to say, or one equals one. And I'm going to end that with some comments in SQL. Uh, in my SQL, these are comments, commenting out anything that is left that might mess this query up. And if I run that, we see that we get all of the posts. So what is happening here? Well, the database is seeing uh, month equals 999, no posts have been returned, or one equals one, and one equals one is true. This makes the whole query true, so it's gonna return all the posts. Uh, in the same fashion, if we enter one equals two, which is obviously false, then we shouldn't see any posts, and if we do that, we don't see any posts. So we have found an SQL injection here. Now, obviously that's a great vulnerability, but in this case, we need to get uh, an XSS going on this page. So we need to dig a lot deeper into this SQL injection. 
In order to get a better idea of how this SQL injection works, let's try to make out a mapping of what is happening on the backend here. So I'm just going to type in an SQL query. It's obviously going to start with a select and it's going to select a, uh, a certain number of columns here. Uh, we don't know how many, we don't know what it's selecting here, but it's selecting something from a database. And we also don't know the name of the database. What else do we know? Well, we know that there's going to be like a where here, where or um, month. We don't know if that's correct, but whatever. Where or month equals our input. That is what we're dealing with. Now, what do we want to do? Well, we want to display new content on the page because we need to get an XSS. So how can we add content to this select? Well, you might say, well, we can just put a semicolon and then start a new select. Sadly, that won't work um, because by default that is disabled in MySQL and uh, you can test it on the server, but that won't work. However, there's another way to add content to this query and that's using a union because then we can union another select statement like one, two, three, together with our previous one. And then I also add these comments at the end to make sure that we comment out any garbage at the end. Now, what is important here, our union. In our union, the second select needs to, needs to select the same amount of columns as the first select. And obviously we don't know the amount of columns here. So that's something that we'll have to figure out, but let's try this out. So I'm gonna, change our month to be something that will return no posts like this. And now we can say, well, I'm going to add a union select of one, two, three to that. And that gives us an error. So that is not the right amount of columns. Well, let's try four columns An error again. Okay. Let's try five columns. And now we see some output on the screen. That is, that is great. We see, for example, that two is our title, five is our date, and three is the content. So we already have some more information. First of all, that there's five columns. So five question marks here. We know that the second column is our title. The third one is our content. And then the fifth one is our creation date. Okay, so now this is what everything looks like, but to be honest, we don't need to know the names of these columns. We just need to add some other content, a payload onto the screen because we are inputting text directly onto the screen and we can choose what that is. So what if I change to, to be a script alert and then close the script deck? What will happen here? I'm gonna select this quickly and I'm also just gonna, just for good sake, try that on the third and the fifth one. What will happen now? Well, we get an error. Why is that? Well, this is not a valid uh, SQL. Uh, strings need to have quotes. So I add a quote everywhere. And uh, if I have added a quote everywhere, then, well, it should work, right? Time to find out. So if I enter then, we still get that error. Uh, and this is where we kind of, well, that is, that is a bummer. What, what is going on here? Well, let's take a step back and let's just try to enter a simple string so that we know nothing is being blocked. And even a simple string doesn't work. Even a string just containing A doesn't work. So maybe all letters are blocked. So let's remove the letter. And even that is blocked. So at this point, it just seems like quotes are being blocked. And that seems to be a big issue if we want to show a string onto the screen. But MySQL is kind of its whole language. SQL can do so many things and there are a lot of string functions. So here on the documentation of MySQL, I have the string functions and operators page open. And here we see a bunch of these functions that could help us get a string without having to use quotes. Um, for example, you might be smart and say, well, I want to use a from base 64, but you'll see that even your from base 64 needs a string. Okay, so that won't work. However, if you look through all of these, there's there's one, and I think there's only one, maybe there's more, there's one that stands out, and that is the character one. Because the character one, it takes in integers and it outputs text. So, well, let's try that out. I'm gonna try this um, character one and, and let's see what happens here. So I'll change this around with just character one. 
And now we see that my SQ, that we have some text that we chose because we can change this. For example, if we want to change the M, just change the number and we get an N. Uh, we can put text onto the page. That is amazing. So that is one way of doing it. But there's also another way of doing it. So if you didn't find that, then you might have found this one. And that is using hexadecimal literals. Because on this page, explaining hexadecimal literals, it shows right here, for example, that it selects an OX and then just a bunch of uh, hex, and then it returns table. So let's try that out. Let's select this, change our character here for our hexadecimal payloads, and then it shows the text table on to there. Uh, so that is also a very easy way of getting text onto the screen. And I'm going to use the hex way of doing it because that is easier in my opinion, because I can just use stuff like CyberChef and really quickly get my payload here into hex. So, so now we can play around with this payload. And I mean, this is going to be the end of the challenge for sure, because now we're going to get our payload to run. I'm just going to put that in all the places where it is reflected on the field on the screen. And I'm going to run that. And our text appears, but we don't have a pop-up. What's going on here? Well, let's take a look in the inspect elements. Under the network tab, I'm going to reload here and go into our request. And the response then is that, well, it is our text, but the characters here, the opening, the opening braces uh, have been, well, sanitized. So this won't work. We cannot get an XSS. There's proper sanitization happening here. What do we do now? Well, right now, this is the point where I'm going to go in with the big guns. I'm going to use a tool that's going to help us with this SQL injection because I have no idea what to do left. So let's take a look at what else is hiding in this database that could potentially help us because, well, this seems to be patched pretty well. What exactly do I mean with the big guns? Well, I mean SQL map. This is, in my opinion, the best tool for chasing down SQL injections. So let's see what this tool can do for us. And running this is, is really easy. You just have your SQL map dash U and then your URL with our uh, parameter here. And if we run that, in my opinion, it still remembers the uh, injection it found, but it's going to run through a lot of steps and it will then tell you where there is a injection. In this case, in the get month, in the month get parameter of type boolean based uh, blind in this case, and it found it through this payload. Okay, that is uh, really nice and clear. And then through a union query here, it also found. Uh, well, the same union that we found, and it also used those hex strings that we used. So that is really cool. But uh, well, that just showed what we already knew. But now I can use this tool to kind of enumerate the database. So with dash dash databases, I can find all the databases that are present. And if I run that, it will find block, information schema, and so on. But block is the one that I'm interested in. So now I can do, well, I want to find for the block, I want to dump that database. So I'll just dump that whole database. It starts doing some things. And as you can see here, it first dumped the post table. And this post table has an ID, a message, a title, an author, which is a number, and a date time. That is kind of what we expected. Then we also have the table user, which has an ID, a name, a picture. And then lastly, we have the table YouTube, which has a video with a URL that you should all know. Uh, but let's take a look at this, this user, because that is quite interesting. Uh, the author is an ID that points to another table, that points to a user in another table. So that is probably why in our query, we couldn't see the author, it was empty, because we entered a number, an ID that was not present. Uh, but let's try to change that to one or two and see if we can actually see some author names. So in our earlier query, I can change the four to one, and now it shows Anton, and if I change the one to two, now it shows Jake. So uh, a second query is being done here. First of all, it does this first query that gets all the blog posts, and then it get, does another query that gets all the users. But what does that query look like? Well, I quickly wrote it out. It's going to select one, two, or three columns from the users table where the user ID is our input. 
it's as easy as that. And since there was an SQL injection in our first query, the chances are quite high that there's also an SQL injection in the second query. So let's try to exploit that. I'm gonna go back to Cyberchef here. Uh, we still have our earlier payloads, hex encoded, but now we're also gonna uh, hex encode a new payload for our nested SQL injection, also called a second order injection. So uh, in this case, again, we're gonna enter an ID that doesn't exist, and then we're gonna do a union select of, in this case, one, two, three, just to see if that is the right amount of columns. If I now take that hex and paste that in here, we will see that yes or two shows up on the screen. That is amazing, that is so, so cool, because now we can just get our payload in there and then it will all work and we'll be done with this challenge. So I'm gonna grab the hex for our payload and change this to, to our payload. Then we have to hex all of that once again, get this hex and throw it into our URL. And now we have not solved the challenge. Why is this not working? Why is nothing showing up here? Well, if we go into our console, we will see something that everybody hates to see, and that is that uh, our script couldn't execute because there is a CSP present here, a content security policy. And yes, if we go into the network tab and look at our request at the headers, then we will see that there is a content security policy ruining our day once again. So, uh, well, we have to get past that CSP. So we need to bypass this CSP and we've done that in the past in other challenges and in that case we used the CSP evaluator to see if it was possible. And I've pasted in our CSP here, so we have a default source of self, so all files from the source from our own self page are allowed. All files coming from .googleapis.com from .gstatic.com and from .cloudsletter.com. Now, if I check this CSP, it's gonna say that there's a high severity finding and that is a default source should not have these pages with a star because that's dangerous. And it also explains why it's dangerous. For example, for, for cloudsletter.com, uh, this page is known to host Angular libraries which allow a bypass of this CSP. Now, bypasses for the CSP are possible on all three of these versions, but in today's video, we're gonna, we're gonna check out the one for Cloudflare because, well, Cloudflare, it hosts files and some of the files it hosts may be dangerous. So in this case, uh, the payload looks like this. You can find this after Googling a little bit. Uh, but here we see we have a script tag which loads prototype.js. We also have another script tag which loads angular.js, uh, an old version. And then we um, start an Angular app and we do this payload, which is gonna document, which is gonna alert document.domain. And uh, yeah, that is the dangerous thing here. That is all you need to do. And in that case, I've obviously put it through our hexadecimal, uh, uh, I put it in into our SQL and payload. And now if I go back to Chrome and I enter this, we will see that we get our nice pop-up that we so desire. And that is how you solve this challenge by bypassing the Cloudflare part of the content security policy. Now it's also possible to bypass the GStat or to find um, a way to bypass on GStatic and on Google APIs. And they are really, really interesting, but I'm not gonna tell you about them because for these challenges, a lot of people write really cool write-ups. And on Twitter, there will be a tweet that has all of those write-ups in one tweet. So you can go visit them and read the ways that other people have solved them because a lot of other people did solve it and they did it in different ways. Uh, they, for example, did this bypassing of the content security policy in different ways. So definitely check out their write-ups as well. But as far as we're concerned, we have solved this challenge. This payload works. It will also work on Firefox and that is amazing. So after all of those steps, after keeping on digging deeper and deeper, we have solved this challenge. And that brings us to the end of this video, of course. I hope you were able to follow along and I hope you understand what happened here. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them down below and tell me, did you solve this challenge when you tried it? Or where did you get stuck? Uh, let me know in the comments. As always, if you liked the video, like it. And I hope to see you back next month for another challenge. Take care, guys.